All right, welcome to Basics of Education Advocacy 2, a Special Education Conflict Resolution. This is our second um, webinar in a series of three that really covers the basics of education advocacy. Uh, this program is uh, designed for pro bonos or practicing attorneys who are interested in volunteering in this area of law. Um, and we'll go through more an opportunity we have here at LAF um, to volunteer. One last time, I'm going to go through some logistics. If you have questions, you can use the chat bubble at the top of your screen. Looks like a little um, word bubble. Just click on that to enter your questions. We'll try to address them during the presentation, but we'll definitely have time at the end as well. Um, so you'll just submit your questions to the whole group. You should be able to hear my voice, and you should be able to see our screen, which is a PowerPoint we'll be going through today. Um, if you're seeking CLE credit for this training, it qualifies for an hour of credit, and you should email me, Callie Burnett, with your ARDC number if you have not already. Uh, my contact information will be on the last slide at the end of this presentation. So we're going to get started. Thanks for joining us. Um, here's today's agenda. We're going to talk a bit about LFA's, uh, LAF's work. We're going to look at informal special education conflict resolution, IEP meetings, and formal special education conflict resolution, and then we'll pick some questions. Um, we've broken it down in between informal and formal, um, and I think you'll see why as we go through formal uh, is is closer to what you would consider going to court um, in other areas of law, while uh, informal is more of just advocating for your client. Uh, today we have two great presenters with us. We have Kate, who's a staff attorney here in LAF, and we have Caroline, who is an LAF Equal Justice Works Fellow. Um, they'll probably tell you a little bit more about their projects, and we'll see some in a minute. And I'm Callie Burnett, the VISTA attorney here. Here's a bit about LAF. LAF is the largest provider for free civil legal services in Cook County. We take cases under five big umbrellas or practice groups, the immigrant and workers' rights group, consumer group, housing, public benefits, and children and families. Um, our education law group falls under the children and families umbrella. We have a DCFS education project representing uh, wards. We have a pro bono education project, uh, which pairs volunteer attorneys um, with clients uh, who need education services. We have an unmet mental health needs project, and we have an options and alternative schools project. So those address specific areas of education law issues. Uh, some cases we include and are Cases include special education, discipline, residency issues, so school district residency issues, homeless students' rights, um, school records requests, bullying and safety issues. Uh, this is just a snapshot of our education law team here at LAF. You'll see my name up there under VISTA attorney. You can also see Caroline and Kate, our presenters for today, um, as well as the rest of our team. Uh, we actually just got a new paralegal, Eliza, so that will be changed for our um, presentation next week. But this gives you a snapshot of who at LAF is working on education issues. Working with LAF, if you um, have been attending these webinars and really find the topic of education law interesting, we would love to have you volunteer with us. We hold monthly um, you can sign up and volunteer to work with the clinic. During a clinic, you conduct intake appointments, review documents, give legal advice, and identify brief services a client might need. Um, you do all this with the support of LAF staff. Um, and so we'd really love to have you volunteer with us if this is an area of law you're interested in. You can email me um, at the end of the presentation. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Kate. She's going to start us on our first topic, which is informal special education conflict resolution. Again, if you have any questions, please use the chat box to submit them. Okay. 
Okay, so turning first to informal conflict resolution, on this list of five issues, we're going to go through each one, but really, other than requesting a CSC request, requesting records, a demand letter, the right to observe, requesting a meeting, those activities could occur at any point in your case. So they are highly likely to occur at the beginning of a case, but they're you know, resources and options that you have throughout. Um, first, starting with a records request, under federal and state law, a parent has the right to access and review their student's records. Um, every district kind of manages this process differently. So while the law governing it is the same, um, who you are receiving a response from, whether it be the director of student services, the superintendent, the student's case manager, that may all be different. Um, we recommend submitting a written rec records request, make sure that it is signed and dated. And then when you're directing your request, we recommend sending that to um, the district's Sorry, the district superintendent. Um, and if you if your student is receiving special education services, you can also look up um, who is the director of that department within a district usually. It's usually publicly available information and include them on the letter as well. Um, also, if you know that that district is represented by an attorney, whether that be in-house counsel or a private firm, we recommend copying them as well. And then just as a side note, for CPS cases, those records requests can be submitted directly to an online, um, well, to an email address, and they will manage that process. Within your records request, um, there's a lot of information that you should include, such as the name of your student, school district, what school they're currently attending, um, and then also any other schools that that student may have attended within the district. I think that's a really important piece to include um, just in hopes that you get a full response the first time and it doesn't need to be precise if you know for example that your student attended second grade at two different schools but you're not sure the exact dates you can just include you know your best estimate or summary of where you think they include where they attended schools and when um, skipping down if you want to highlight any specific records i think that's another important piece that can really help you get a full response the first time. If you know that there's a particular record that you're very interested in, it's very important to the case. So for example, a misconduct report from a particular incident or um, specific behavioral data that you know the teacher is collecting on a regular basis, um, those are that's information that you can um, specifically highlight in your letter just so that in hopes that um, in hopes that the district you know collects those records and sends them to you within the requested timeline. Um, the time frame, the second to last bullet point references this. So technically under the Illinois School Student Records Act, the district has 15 school days to respond to your request. As soon as you have consent from the parent, submitting a records request is very important because that timeline in, as a practical matter actually ends up being pretty long. So 15 school days, assuming that there's no breaks, there's no you know, non-attendance days, there are no um, other reasons that students wouldn't be in school, um, it can end up taking almost a month to get a request, to get a response to a request. So again, I would recommend requesting records as soon as you get the consent. Um, and then that last point, if the student is over 12 and there are going to be mental health records included in that response or in your request, having the student sign off on the consent form is also necessary. Um, so this is just a brief summary of records that you might um, this is just a brief summary of records that you might request and might look for in the response that you receive. So enrollment data, enrollment data, um, there should be a record of attendance and school transfers. Um, the district should have that for every school that the student has attended. 
special education documents. This could be, there are a lot of things that fall under this category, but one kind of benchmark that I personally use, if you are requesting for records for a student that has an IEP today, then you should expect at least one round of special education evaluations, eligibility documentation, and IEP progress reports. That could be an IEP report card or progress reporting. Those records must exist if your student has an IEP. Similarly, if your student has had an IEP for years, then there should be multiple sets of evaluations, probably one to two, maybe three eligibility documentations, um, and then an IEP for every single year that that student has been in school. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of what you should expect in your response. If your student does not have an IEP, the school district should still be giving you grades, misconduct reports, test scores. Um, one thing that you may see within your records or you may request if you know they exist is MTSS or RTI data, which that's just a, that's an abbreviation for generalized interventions that are happening with a student who does not yet have an IEP. Um, so it can be good evidence that a student is receiving additional support and may be in need of special education services. Um, and then the last bullet point there about electronic databases, most of those apply to CPS, but as we mentioned before, districts kind of manage their records and organize their records differently. So just making sure that you have all the records that you need, it may take more than one request. It may take some significant follow-up. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so for a demand letter, um, there are a number of reasons that you may submit a demand letter to the district, and there are a number of issues that you may be addressing in a single demand letter. Um, as Callie has noted here, a uh, demand letter can be used to request that a student be enrolled, that their placement be changed, that transportation be implemented. There are a lot of different parts of IEPs as well that can be addressed through a demand letter. There are some issues that can also be resolved without an IEP meeting, and there are some issues that will need to be resolved with an IEP meeting. So there are a lot of moving parts in these cases generally, and to the greatest extent possible, I think, in your demand letter, either, for, either by using subheadings or um, just very clearly organized writing, it can be helpful to delineate what issues exactly are you trying to address in this letter, and what is the resolution that you are seeking and the resolution may be different for each issue. So for example, tra implementing transportation, i.e. putting a student on a school bus, is something that you wouldn't necessarily need to have an IEP meeting for if the IEP already provides for transportation. However, if you are requesting that a student receive transportation and it is not yet in the IEP, then you may need to have a meeting. Um, and just kind of, Identifying for each issue what can the district do when you're thinking about what resolution you're requesting. And I usually start every letter to a district with a very brief summary of the purpose of this letter is to blank and then just number out if there are multiple issues, number out everything you're hoping to address, and also including any deadlines that go with those requests. So, for example, if you're requesting that an IEP be implemented. That has a deadline. That has a 10-day deadline for the district. Um, if you're requesting records, like we just talked about, that has a 15 school day timeline on it. And timelines are scattered throughout federal and state regs, so just making sure that you're aware of any timeline associated with what you're requesting can also be really helpful. Um, and then typically, if I'm sending a demand letter to a district for um, a student where we haven't worked together on this case before, so it's kind of the first contact with the district, I will usually include a brief background paragraph on the student. Um, so just a brief snapshot of who my client, of who the student is, um, age, what grade they're in, what school they go to, 
what eligibility they're under, if any, um, any diagnoses that are relevant, and then kind of go into the issues at play. Um, just with the thought that the district may be forwarding this letter to their representatives, to their attorneys, and if this is kind of the opening of the case, I think it can help things to get off on a more efficient um, course if we're clear on who the student is and what they need. Um, the pants right to observe, this is another thing that may happen multiple times throughout your case. Um, and observation can be really helpful for clarifying implementation issues. So for example, if a parent is concerned that the student does not have aid support or is not receiving pullout services for uh, educational instruction, um, every school, much like records, every school manages observation differently. Um, every district can also manage this differently. So there may be forms that a, student, a parent needs to complete. Um, basically, I would recommend having the parent call the school ahead of time or you contact the district ahead of time to clarify what process goes into this. Um, I would not recommend just going to the school and asking to observe. I, it may not be the most efficient use of time if they do need these forms submitted and approved ahead of time. Um, however, regardless of their process, the parent still has this right. So um, just keep in mind that the procedure may be something to figure out. And then when you're thinking about having a parent go observe, one thing that can be really helpful is uh, putting together a checklist with your client before the observation. So discussing, you know, what exactly are the concerns? What do we think we can find out during an observation? Um, if a student is struggling at a particular time of the day, or in a particular class, then maybe try to, aid, to schedule the observation so that the parent is seeing, you know, what does this transition look like? What does math class look like? What does unstructured time look like? Um, just so you're making the most efficient use of your client's time and really gathering as much information as possible. And kind of shifting gears, so, if a student does not yet have an IEP, then it may be necessary, if the parent hasn't already, to request a case study evaluation. Um, and parents have the right to request a case study evaluation at any time. There may be pushback if this is happening closer to the end of the school year, but again, they can request at any time that their student be evaluated for services. Um, this is just done through, we usually submit this through a letter, similar to a demand letter um, that we talked about earlier for other special ed issues. Um, again, make sure it's signed, dated, um, includes just basic background information about the student, what school they're going to, birthday, um, direct it to the school's case manager, and then obviously copy, if you know that the district is represented, copying the district's representatives as well. When you're describing the student's history, it can also be helpful. Generally speaking, you're setting out your case for why this student should be evaluated for services. If you've already requested records from the district or you have records from the parent, it can be really helpful to attach these as exhibits to your letter. So for example, if you're describing an incident that occurred, you could attach the misconduct report as evidence that the incident happened. And to the greatest extent possible that you're able to use the district's own records to establish why there's reason to believe that this student may need services, the better. Um, and attaching exhibits can be especially, especially helpful if your student is new to whatever school they are attending. So even if they were in the same district, but they did not attend the school last year or the year before, Attaching records from the previous school or previous district can be really helpful for the student's new IEP team just in case they don't have access to those records. Um, and it can also, if a student's been struggling with behavior or struggling in particular academic areas for years, that is important information for the team to consider. And as I noted before, they may not have all the records they need to properly consider that. Um, you can also consider attaching any outside service provider or medical reports that support the position that the student needs to be evaluated. 
Um, and then the last two bullets here kind of talk about the timeline. So this is 14 school days. After you submit your letter, um, the team needs to make a decision about whether or not an evaluation is warranted and then identify what assessments or evaluations need to be completed or they need to inform the parent in writing that a CSE is not warranted. And at that point, we'll talk about due process later in this presentation, but at that point, if the school decides a CSE is not warranted, that could be one, one event that a parent may consider filing for due process over. Um, also, just when you're submitting a CSE request, I think one general thing to keep in mind is that the legal standard is pretty favorable for the parent in this, on this particular issue. So basically what we're pointing out is that the student may be in need of services. Was there a reason in the past for the district to suspect that the student may be in need of services? Um, and kind of emphasizing that throughout that there's plenty of reason to think that the student may be in need of services. Um, and then the last point, one thing that can also be helpful, if you know that there are specific evaluations that your student needs, so for example, an assessment of executive functioning or articulation or fine motor, something that you know off the top of your head or parent has identified they, they should be evaluated in, I would include that in the letter as well and be prepared to explain it at the domain meeting. But as much as you can kind of remind the team, you know, this is what we think is necessary, the better. Okay. Um, okay, this next slide was just included as a reminder. So when you send that le letter, just be aware, after you send it, these three things could be on the horizon. Um, one thing to keep in mind briefly about the assessment planning meeting or domain meeting, the team may not yet be in agreement to evaluate, so you may be doing two things at this meeting. You may be discussing whether or not the evaluation is referred, and you may be discussing exactly what evaluations or assessments need to be completed, um, which I think you guys talked about in the previous uh, training as well. From there, the school, if the school is in agreement and the student is referred for an evaluation, they have 60 school days to complete it and then you will be headed to an eligibility conference where you decide whether or not the student is eligible. Um, okay. So really quickly, the biggest takeaway I think from requesting an IEP meeting, there are two dates that you want to figure out before you request a meeting. Number one, the first bullet point is your student's annual IEP review. An IEP has to be reviewed at least once a year that date will, that meeting will automatically happen. So figuring out, and the date is usually on the front cover page of an IEP, figuring out when the annual review is is really important because if you are requesting an IEP meeting, they may just move up the annual review and then discuss your concerns and the annual review all at once. So identifying when that meeting is happening can just help you figure out what timeline your student is already on. If their annual review has already been completed, then there's no next, there's probably no next meeting for that school year, in which case you will need to ask for the meeting and they will need to give you a response about whether or not they're going to convene it. Similarly, every three years a student will be re-evaluated, which is that process we just talked about, but it will be automatic. The parent does not have to ask for it. Um, figuring out when your student was last re-evaluated or will be re-evaluated is also just a helpful timeline to keep in mind when you're thinking about requesting a meeting. Um, as far as letting the um, team know why you want this meeting, try to be as specific as possible, especially if there are things that the team will need to do outside of the meeting to prepare. So if you want a behavior intervention plan and they need to collect data in advance, it's helpful to let them know that that is one topic that you want to discuss. Um, sorry, I rushed a little bit on those last slides, but Caroline is up next. Okay, so now that you have requested an IEP meeting, we are going to talk about preparing for the meeting itself. Um, and a lot of this also, the preparation is in part when you are requesting the meeting, um, like Kate said, making sure that you are telling them what you want to talk about in the meeting. 
Um, but when you actually are at the point where your meeting is in the next few days, you do want to be sure that you review the records with the client. Sometimes these can be large amounts of records. It's important just to pick out what what are the major issues in your mind and asking them what the major issues in their mind are so that then you can go through and talk to them about what is there. Um, one of the things we point out is to ask for the client's input on the previous findings, the IEPs, the evaluations. One thing that we commonly see, there's a test that is called the WISC, W-I-S-C, um, and it is oftentimes used as an IQ test. And kids that um, are AD, ADD, ADHD, or just have maybe some other learning issues, but it's not necessarily an intellectual disability, might test very low on that. And parents can be very discouraged if, say, their child scores a 60, and that indicates a severe intellectual disability. And I think it's just important to talk that through with parents and temper that for them so that then if something is like that is discussed at the meeting, they aren't caught off guard or um, it doesn't kind of really throw your plans out the window because they are so worried about a certain result. Um, definitely go over the facts of the case, what's going on, why you're having the meeting, but also ask the parent for an update. Has the child gotten in trouble lately? Has the child been doing better or worse? Um, what have grades been looking like lately? How's homework been going lately? Um, a lot of times our clients, parents, don't necessarily identify right away what major issues are. But if you kind of prod further and ask things like, how many hours does it take to do homework a night? And how many reminders does it take to do each homework worksheet a night? Then you can kind of gather more and more what the child might be struggling with. And obviously, with children with more complex disabilities, it's harder to gauge those questions. But if a child has you know, a learning disability or ADHD, oftentimes a good starting point in those questions is asking them just questions about what a child in that grade without a disability might be doing or expected to do, um, and asking similar things. Can they read through the page? Can, do they lose their place on the page? Do they know their times tables? Um, and just being able to know those little anecdotal stories going in will also help you understand kind of things that the teacher alludes to or other conversations maybe the mom and teacher have had that you'll then know about that come up during the meeting. You definitely want to have uh, goals for the client um, or work with the client to create goals for the meeting. And that goes hand in hand with the next, which is creating an agenda. And it's hard for parents oftentimes to stick to that agenda, um, but if the agenda corresponds with their goals, you can help them stick to that. And it sometimes does require you to be somewhat firm to make sure that you are sticking with the agenda. If you don't, you risk um, missing something since these meetings can go on for a while. Um, it's hard, it's easy to lose track if you've talked about everything um, and it's best to get it all covered. So preparing for yourself, just be sure to review the records, including the past IEPs and the present levels of the performance, looking at the um, IEP report cards and seeing if they have been meeting their goals recently. Commonly, districts will not fill out the, that measurement in the IEP report card. And so if that's something you notice, that would be something you would want to bring up in the meeting the next day. Um, create a checklist of things that you want to address. So that can go with your agenda. Your agenda would be your broader point, something you would be willing to share with others. Um, but then your checklist would be something that, you know, with each bullet or each agenda item, these would be your bullets under it. I oftentimes like to mark the things that I anticipate to be the most time-consuming discussions so that then when we are talking about each item, we can even preface with that point with, okay, we know this will be a rather simple issue, let's just get this done really quickly. Um, and then just, that is also a way to flag in your mind to keep things moving along. Because sometimes the team will just decide to dwell on a point for a while just because they feel like talking that day more and 
then all of a sudden at the end of the meeting, you don't have time for the most uh, important thing or the thing that will be the most time consuming. Prepare to ask questions at the meeting. Oftentimes I like to write those down um, in the margins of the IEPs, but then I also like to have a list of them and I like to encourage the parent to write them. Sometimes our clients um, don't have um, the most developed writing abilities. And so I sometimes will suggest that the parent write them down, but then I will also always offer to write them myself if they would like to dictate them. Um, just to really remove that point of, uh, or uncomfortable moment for them if, if writing is something that they're not as comfortable doing. Um, and then always request a copy of the notice of conference to make sure that you're prepared for all the topics that are going to discuss that day. Um, again, just making sure that before you go into the meeting, you know what the parent liked about the last IP, what they didn't like about the last IEP, and maybe even going through each section line by line, looking at the accommodations and say, did your child get these? Do you know if your child got these? Did your child like these? Uh, was your child embarrassed about going to a separate test room and that really caused a problem? All those things are things you'd like to ask. Um, so at the meeting, um, any team member can only be excused if the parent consents and the team member submits a written report prior to the meeting. In real life, um, oftentimes you will show up and not every team member will be there or a team member will say that I have to go in 45 minutes. I think this comes down to picking your battles. You know, if, if the team member needs to be there and you think that it's really important, then you have every right and the parent has every right to request for the team member to stay if they haven't, um, if the parent doesn't consent to their leaving. However, sometimes, you know, if it means, you know, building relationships with the team and you really don't need the school nurse for the entire time because the child doesn't take medications and doesn't have significant medical issues, then it might be worth excusing them even if the team member hasn't submitted the written report prior to the meeting. Um, so at the meeting, be sure to ask lots of questions, gather information. Um, if they're ever talking about a complex issue or topic, make sure that your client understands it. And if it seems like your client isn't understanding it, but you don't want to embarrass them, you can always say, you know, help me understand and take the blame for yourself just to be sure that they do communicate it for your client. <laughs> I always like to remind myself that you know, we won't be advocates for our clients forever, and so we have to equip them to be advocates for their children after our representation. And so asking those questions so that then the client is better equipped for future IEP meetings is really key. Um, make sure your questions get answered. So sometimes I will type my question down and highlight it on my computer so that I know to go back to it because they don't always answer the question. And sometimes there's multiple people talking at once. We have a thing about taking copious notes. Um, that is important and you want really all of these points in your notes. At the same time, I don't want it to distract you from the main conversation. Um, I think there's easy ways to get information a little bit later in the conversation if you miss it because you're talking at a moment or you wanted to listen to someone. For instance, with the participants' names and titles, there's a sign-in sheet that will go around and I oftentimes will just keep the sign-in sheet by myself for a few minutes and type up all the names that are listed on the sign-in sheet um, because I can't get every name and title as they introduce themselves around the table. Um, be sure to get like the anecdotal reports and observations, things that you won't see in the IEP but maybe are important later. Um, so now as we go forward, um, Let's see, there's no time limit at the IEP meetings. Um, if you need to continue on another day, that's totally fine. Um, and you don't have to finish the IEP before you leave. Um, however, if you do finish the IEP, you have to get a copy of it. And a lot of times they'll say, we'll email it to you later, or our printers are having issues. And I really would insist on getting a copy of the IEP because there's sometimes issues with things changing um, or uh, things happening where 
something you thought they were putting in that AP is actually not there. And be sure to review everything, even though you've just gone over it in person, read over it before you leave. Um, but the meeting isn't the end, and so you will have to ask for progress reports, um, report cards, and get updates. If you disagree with the IEP, you should um, draft a dissent, which is on our next slide. So um, if you disagree with the IEP, um, let the team know whatever they're deciding that you do disagree. Don't have the parent sign the waiver. Um, that would allow them to waive the 10-day waiting period if you don't want the placement to change. Now, if you just disagree with something um, like the number of minutes and, you know, you want it increased by 60 and they're increased by 30, um, that might be a little bit different, but um, always draft an IEP to send. These do work sometimes. Um, and that would be a letter um, saying what your disagreement is. So the next portion is the IEEs, and these are individualized educational evaluations. Um, and this is when if a parent disagrees with the evaluation that the district has done, the parent has a right to request an evaluation at district's expense. And we list down here what you need to include in the IE request. Um, and you want to do this when the evaluations are incomplete, um, not comprehensive, incorrectly administered, or um, if the district fails to administer an agreed upon assessment. So when you request an IEE, the district can either respond, and they have to, within five days of the request, granting the request or denying um, the request, at which time if they deny it, the district will be filing due process. This whole timeline, if the district denies it and files due process, can be a quick turnaround. So I usually suggest requesting records and making sure you have all the records you want before filing an IEE. Um, and down below, we have just some little provisions about um, payment and what the districts must consider. Now, if I'm going into formal conflict resolution, which I did mention that the district could file due process, so this is an easy lead-in. Um, this is when you would be going to court or going before a hearing officer um, and going through the administrative law process. So um, there's three major areas that we're going to talk about, state compliance complaints, um, administrative due process hearing requests, and the DOE's uh, Office of Civil Rights Complaints, or OCR complaints. Um, so a state compliance complaint. If you think about uh, a compliance complaint, think about it's for procedural violations, failures to implement, and systemic issues, or failure to follow an order. So it's not about um, debating over services. This is about you already agreed what's in the IEP and they're not following the IEP or their policies are a problem um, or the systemic problem. So this is not to debate services. This is if they're failing to meet deadlines, that kind of thing. Um, and you do have a one-year statute of limitations, so it is a quick turnaround here. Um, so the process is, is the parent files a complaint with uh, the Board of Education, so ISBE, alleging the violation. The district has the authority to respond and can propose mediation. Um, be clear what you want to be your remedy, because in this process, sometimes districts will kind of try to bully their way through that process, and, and you really want to know what the parent wants as their goal so that then you don't um, Agree to mediation if that won't get you your end result. Um, if there isn't any agreement reached in mediation, then ISBE will conduct an investigation um, and will write a decision uh, within 60 days of the complaint. Um, ISBE does have the authority to order comp ed, but I think that our general understanding is that's a better uh, filing a due process hearing. Is a better avenue for that, and Kate will talk about that later. 
uh, state compliance complaints can be good for evidence gathering, though, because if you have the decision based on the investigation, you could later file due process with that. Um, and so that's what I was just talking about here. Um, so you can get comp ed and reimbursement and other corrective actions, such as a new policy or the teachers get trained. Um, but oftentimes, to get those things, it does take a due process filing. Um, so I will now pass it on to Kate. Okay, and just to piggyback off what Caroline was saying, uh, due process due process is closer to court type litigation um, and where there is a disagreement about what is in the IEP, what services a student is getting, um, what their placement is, whether or not they should be evaluated. Those big questions, that's when a parent should probably consider filing for due process. Um, so as I on the slide, this is similar to a trial, but it's before a hearing officer instead of a judge. And during um, the due process process, you're resolving major disputes between the parent and the school district um, regarding identification, evaluation. So as we mentioned before, if a CSE request is denied, that could be a good time to file for due process. Or educational placement, what services they're getting, what in what setting a student is receiving services. Um, Additionally, this slide should say um, a free appropriate public education. So that's kind of the standard that you're going to hear thrown around a lot or the acronym FAPE. Um, when you have filed for due process, the issue that you're trying to resolve is whether or not a student has received a free appropriate public education, um, whether or not the services in their IEP are reasonably calculated to provide them with that. And this, this part of the presentation is a snapshot of what due process looks like. We are happy to provide much more support and guidance if um, your case were ever to reach that point. Um, and then lastly, the, the third bullet point where it says a procedural, where it notes a procedural error. Um, if your client is upset with a procedural error, which could be not having all the appropriate members of an IE team, IEP team assembled for a meeting, um, or not responding within a certain amount of school days as required by the school code. Um, those types of procedural errors in, are not going to be remedied or addressed by the hearing officer unless you can also show that that procedural error resulted in a denial of FAPE, meaning that the student did not receive a free appropriate public education, it significantly impeded the parent's participation, or cause of deprivation of educational benefit. Um, and FAPE is kind of a complicated concept in the sense that it is um, not well defined by existing law. So um, generally speaking, FAPE is going to be educational instruction that is specially designed to meet your child, meet the child's unique needs, and every IEP must be reasonably calculated to provide a student with um, some educational benefit. So we're looking at progress there. But as you can tell from those statements, how you prove that up can be a complicated process. Um, so just taking a step back, as Caroline pointed out with a compliance complaint, that is a more straightforward complaint when there's been a clear failure to implement or a clear procedural issue that the State Board of Education can then investigate and determine whether or not that happened. Whereas due process is more litigation around whether or not a student's IEP is appropriate and whether or not they've been receiving appropriate services. Um, so there are some requirements under state and federal law for what need to be included in a, in a due process complaint. First of all, it needs to be delivered to the district superintendent or directed to the super, uh, superintendent and delivered. We usually hand deliver, but you can also mail. And a courtesy copy should be sent to the Illinois State Board of Education. After you file for due process, you're going to start to get notices from ISB and from your hearing officer. So it's important to pay attention. Some of the dates from ISB are auto-generated, whereas, you know, for notices and some 
from the hearing officer are more what you've discussed with the hearing officer, but keeping really close count of all the records that come from ISBE and that come from your hearing officer are very important, and there are a number of documents, especially at the beginning of the case, that are going to be sent to you that um, are really important to review. And then within your due process complaint, you need to include the name of the student, where the student lives, the name of the school that the student is attending, and a specific description of the problem and the claims that you are addressing in your due process complaint, as well as proposed resolution for the problem. Technically, a district can file a motion saying that your complaint is insufficient, so it is good to be as specific as possible in your complaint. Um, that motion, you know, those motions are not filed on a regular basis, but just keeping that in mind when you're when you're drafting the substance of your complaint. Um, sorry, and just to clarify, when I was mentioning ISBE, ISBE kind of manages the whole process. So ISBE is going to be um, similar to the way the clerk of the court manages a civil case where you're entering orders and things in court. ISBE is the one who's keeping track of your dates, um, assigning your hearing officer, assigning your mediators and making sure that you're sticking to your timeline that's set forth in federal and state law. So that's kind of their role when a due process complaint has been filed. Um, just some legal considerations for the due process complaint. Um, the burden of persuasion is always going to be on the filing party, and the burden of production is going to be on the district, which is just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about you know, the evidence that you will need to present. The statute of limitations is two years from the date that the parent or guardian should have knew or should have known the basis of the complaint, and all claims must be included in the hearing request. So you cannot raise a claim for the first time at hearing. And any previously, any claims that could have been alleged may be deemed waived at that point. Um, you do, most hearing officers, if, if you have filed a complaint and you need to amend, most hearing officers um, will be open-minded about that generally, but to the greatest extent possible that you can include all claims in your first complaint, that would be great. And then this slide contains a lot of information and it is a really great, I think it's a really great snapshot of what you can anticipate if you file for due process, but just keep in mind that each of these topics, there, there's a lot to know about each one of them. So we just talked about requesting a hearing and obviously that we need to deliver that to the district and to the super or and to ISB. After within five days of you filing, you should receive notification from ISB of who your hearing officer is. From there, you will have five days to strike your hearing officer as a matter of right. And likewise, the district will have that right as well. Um, Regardless of whether or not the hearing officer continues with the case, the district still has only 10 days to respond to your request. Um, and keeping an eye on that deadline is helpful. Just um, districts, that's not negotiable. The district needs to respond if it is a regular due process. If it is an expedited due process, technically the district does not need to respond. But this timeline is dealing with just regular due process, not on an expedited timeline. If you look to the middle of this graphic, um, you can kind of think of this process in two pieces. So first being the resolution period, which is going to last 30 days, and then the pre-hearing period, which is 45 days. After, after these four things have happened, um, the district may, you may decide to convene a resolution session with the district, which a resolution session is just a meeting between you, your client, the district and their representatives, possibly their attorney or their district rep, um, and the case manager from the school to see if the issues in the complaint can be resolved. Parents have the right to waive resolution, as noted up here. So if the parties decide to have resolution, that can happen pretty quickly. If the parent decides to waive resolution, then the pre-hearing period will begin immediately. As kind of a, another consideration, a parent can also request, and the parties can agree, to engage in mediation instead of resolution. So as I noted with resolution, that's just you, your, part, your client, and the district. Mediation would be you, your client, and a third-party mediator. Um, 
And that should also occur during the resolution period if the parties have agreed to mediation. Um, and B would also facilitate the entire mediation process. So you don't, you and the district don't or have no obligation to go out and find a mediator. Um, the pre-hearing period, the biggest event that you're going to have after mediation or resolution is your pre-hearing conference, which must be convened within 14 days or no less than 14 days before your hearing starts. Um, the next slide we'll talk a little bit more about, sorry, two slides from now, we'll talk a little bit more about what you do during the pre-hearing conference. This is a big event to anticipate and plan for. Um, but basically, that 14 days before hearing, you will need to have preliminary lists of your witnesses and your exhibits. Um, and that must be handed to opposing counsel or sent to opposing counsel and your hearing officer before the pre-hearing conference, usually. Um, the next deadline will be your five-day disclosures, which is a really hard deadline. At that point, you must disclose your final witness list and your exhibit list. Um, including copies of all evidence that you plan to present at hearing. Again, this is a snapshot. We can, if, if you were to start, if you were to file for due process, we're happy to provide more support and kind of guidance through this whole process. Um, generally, preparing for hearing, um, you know, start with developing your theory of the case and determining how you're going to prove each claim. As you probably saw during the first presentation, there are a lot of issues that can come up in each individual case. So you may have a due process complaint that has seven or eight claims, or it may only have two or three. But kind of isolating and clarifying the elements for each claim, what is the law that governs each claim, what evidence do you need for each claim. It, the evidence may be overlapping in certain areas, but getting organized and staying organized with your case plan is really important. Um, as far as evidentiary concerns, oh gosh, okay, we're going to talk like an auctioneer real quick. So as far as evidentiary concerns, um, keep making records requests, um, make sure that you have everything that's up to date, um, ask your client to follow up with their outside providers if there are new records available. Um, witnesses, as far as with older students, I think it is important to consider whether or not you're going to have the student testify. It may not be as important or appropriate for a younger student to testify. Um, you will likely also need an expert witness, which is something that LAF is happy to support you with in figuring out how to facilitate that. But expert witnesses could be your student's outside service providers um, or any evaluators that they have worked with. Um, this is the slide I was talking about for pre-hearing conference. So there are a number of issues that must be discussed at the pre-hearing conference. Some of them are more housekeeping. Some of them are really important, like isolating what issues are going to be decided in this hearing. I think having a clear you know, statement for what you want this hearing officer to consider is really, really important. Um, you all obviously have already said it in your complaint and in your pre-hearing conference disclosures, but it will be probably a significant conversation during the pre-hearing conference. Um, and then this list is really more the housekeeping. Um, where are we going to have the hearing? Usually it's at schools or other district property, um, like district offices. Um, witness order, which if teachers are teaching, um, it usually needs to be during school day hours or contract hours, something to consider. Number of days for the hearing, how, much, how long do you think it will take you to put on your case? And then the order of case also kind of depends on when teachers are available as well. Um, I'm really running out of time, so this pretty much sets out timelines um, for the final decision making. Um, obviously, both parties have appeal rights. Um, if, if you were to file a due process complaint and prevail on behalf of your client, you can file a fee petition in federal court to obtain reasonable attorney's fees and expenses. However, that is not going to include expert witness fees. Um, okay. Do you want Oh, now Caroline is going to talk about the Office for Civil Rights. So these complaints um, you file for uh, moments of discrimination, which obviously it feels like everything would be discrimination, but this is more kind of the overt stuff, like overtly excluding a child from school. Um, this also includes 
the child just as a 504 plan. Um, sometimes it would include issues of the 504 um, that you wouldn't do through the due process process. Um, that would be something we can consult with you on for sure. Um, but the biggest things are um, excluding students from school are common things that we see where they say a child can't come back and they make up 10 reasons why they can't come back for a period of six weeks. Also sexual harassment, um, if a school refuses to investigate or do anything about sexual harassment that's going on at school or um, that occurred and now is impacting the child at school because the harasser also attends at school. Um, so OCR has issued a case processing manual, which is pretty comprehensive. One thing we should point out is the complaint must be filed within 100 calendar, 180 calendar days of the date of the alleged discrimination. Their case processing manual says the last date of discrimination. However, um, it appears to be their current policy right now is that they will consider anything that has occurred within 180 days of filing. So you don't actually have very much time. So we would encourage you that if you think that a case should be filed with an OCR complaint, um, that you reach out to us and try to get it filed as soon as possible. Um, okay, so we're going to do a case study now and we're limited on time. Um, so maybe what we'll do is um, open it up to questions and see if there are any right now. Um, you're welcome to look at that and see maybe if you want to submit anything that you think that the steps would be taken. I'll give you about a minute or so to look at it and just, you know, if you can rapid fire think of just one thing that you might do and then we'll go over that. You want to tag team me with? Okay, so now that um, you've briefly been able to read over this, um, I think immediately we're able to see that this child has um, some serious learning issues and you will have to be filing due process likely because the school has now denied um, the evaluation doing it. Um, and so, the, as we mentioned earlier, issues over services would go under due process. Um, and so, filing due process, and if we want to talk about just some of your claims, obviously the refusal to evaluate, but you might also bring up a faith claim um, for their failure to identify this child under the child find provision um, for, and you can go back two years. Mm -hmm. So you can look at um, as far back as, let's see, first grade or maybe kindergarten, depending on when you're filing. But you still could bring all that up in showing a pattern in your argument. Um, there's no statute of limitations of what you can bring up. It would just be what you would be able to get consent, compensatory education over um, that would be included. Okay, do you have any other things that you would point out? Um, one thing you can also just, as you're getting your case ready to go, obviously requesting records and reviewing very closely what progress and charting what, if any, progress you've made with the speech language services and then comparing that to what progress you're seeing in reading and English language arts in general. Uh, so that can include writing as well. And test scores. So there's finding finding a way to organize data in these cases can be really challenging. But here it feels like you know the language concern um, has been ongoing. So gathering as much information as you can that exists within the district's control. Um, about what her language needs may be would be really helpful. And a child like this might actually have um, Social Security income, SSI, 
And if they do, then they've likely been evaluated by a, a consultative evaluator, a CE. So one thing you could pursue is getting those evaluations from their SSI file to then also use that evidence. Great, so it looks like we don't have any questions entered in our chat box right now. Um, we'll give you a couple more minutes if you have any questions. Um, looking, at, we have a just a set of kind of resources that were used with this presentation together and that we just highlight um, if you're interested in this area of law. Um, is the obviously the State Board of Education's website. Rights Law is um, geared towards parents uh, so is the Parent Henner Center Hub. Um, so these are all kind of, I think, starting, if you're new to education law, starting at those sites is great because they're a little more digestible. It doesn't come from a lawyer perspective um, and, or an expert's perspective, but from a parent perspective, which can be a little more um, easy to swallow as you're learning. Uh, I still don't see any questions. Oh, you mentioned SSI. Can you explain how that works? Thanks for your question, Carolyn. Sure. Right, so you would actually need to contact uh, their field office that your client goes to, and your client should know that, and oftentimes they work independently with a case worker or case manager there. Um, each field office also has an attorney contact and a manager, so if you were having trouble um, getting a hold of the case manager, that would be um, somebody you could pursue, and you could always contact us for that contact as well. Um, what you would do is then get a Social Security uh, release of information from your client, and that's actually, you can get that off of Google. Social Security publishes all of their releases, and it's a syllable form. And then you would just submit a similar records request uh, to what your, you would do with the education. The thing you would, would be most interested in is their consultative evaluation. SSI talks, they call that a CE often, but sometimes it would be helpful to also have a hearing officer decision or a decision by an ALJ, an administrative law judge, but really your, your bread and butter is going to be under the CE. The only reason you would maybe want the ALJ decision is if there was a medical expert at the hearing that testified to something that's not in the evaluation. Um, but I'm happy to help anybody through that process if you do decide to do that. Awesome. Thank you for that question, Caroline. So here's our contact information. If you're interested in getting CLE for this presentation, if you're interested in getting some more resources um, on this topic, if you're interested in volunteering with us um, and possibly taking a case as a pro bono attorney, please email me, cburnett at laschicago.org or give me a call. Um, if you want to refer clients to LAF just in general, the, our main intake information is our website and then our phone number. That's great to pass along. We always, um, we always encourage attorneys to pass that information along to low-income clients. Um, and then join us next week for part three, Basics of Ed Advocacy 3, School Discipline. We're going to start at noon, and again, that qualifies for one hour of CLE. Um, I'm also going to be, you should have received an email this morning with a course evaluation for this presentation. Please take some time to fill it out um, and return it to us. We really appreciate your input and um, are looking to do more of these trainings. So thanks so much for joining us um, and we appreciate you spending your lunch hour with us. Have a great one.